So there's Jabeen and there's Lenny, who I'm sure most of you will know. I'm also um, joined by two doctors, Dr. Kieran Collison and Dr. Amar Latif. And what we will have is quite an informal conversation. Um, there are no, if you feel, you know, there are no right or wrong um, questions. If you've got a question that you want to ask, I just suggest you ask it and let's get a response. And then secondly, um, if you look, we were going to, we've had a conversation briefly about the raise hand function and we can't find that. It's normally linked with the participants. Yeah, Nadine, there's a short key. If you press the Alt key and the letter Y, that can do it also. Alt, Alt Y. So Alt Y. What, what you said, Alt Y. I'm, there's nothing happening to me on my machine. Yeah, there might be. Uh, I've just done it again. It works for me. Okay, can I just uh, suggest? Okay, Samir, I'll tell you what we're going to do because something which should work is in your reactions, if you just look at, look at your bar tab, it says reactions, and then you have a choice of um, a clap, a thumbs up, a heart, a laughing face, a wow, and a celebration. So what I'm going to do is look out for anybody who puts one of those signs up and then I will come to you. I'll note, I'll note that you want to come in. Um, so that's one way of asking a question. Another way of asking a question is use the chat feature. So if you click on the chat feature, if you have a question that you want to ask, you know, you may want to actually type that in there. You might do that while somebody else is speaking. Um, and I will make sure then I come to you. Um, also, I just want to point out, I, I think we're really useful if no third party names are used, particularly if people aren't attending this meeting, because what we don't want to do is get into an issue of GDPR, particularly because this will be recorded. So I think I'm going to pause there. Is there any questions that anybody wants to actually ask me before I asked Dr. Amar and Dr. Kieran to actually introduce themselves. Is that quite clear? Okay, I can't see anybody. No, okay, so I'm now going to move to ask Dr. Amar Latif to actually introduce himself a little bit about himself, his, the GP surgery and uh, his work. Uh, thank you, Nadeem. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. It's uh, good to see so many uh, familiar faces on the call. Uh, my apologies, I'm having some slight IT issues this morning, so I'm on my phone uh, rather than my laptop. So uh, apologies for the slightly informal setting that may appear. Um, so mo uh, a lot of people on the call will know me already. Um, uh, my name is Amir Latif. Uh, I'm a GP. Uh, proud to say I was born and bred in Oxford. Uh, many of you will know me personally, if not me, will know my family. Um, I work as a GP just outside Oxford at Ensham Medical Practice. Um, I do a lot of out of hours, particularly at months away. Um, and uh, I um, uh, I'm also have a role as clinical lead for long term conditions at Oxfordshire Clinical Commissioning Group. Uh, and really the purpose of this meeting is to uh, come together um, hear what the concerns of the community are. Uh, some of you will have seen that last week the masjid asked me to put together a short video uh, to promote the vaccine um, and uh, that will have gone out via social media. Uh, some of you will have seen it. I know the masjid also promoted it via its own social media channels. Um, we know from the early data that the uptake of the vaccine seems to be lower in um, communities that are from uh, a black and ethnic minority background um, and that obviously is something which is of concern because actually uh, the illness is something which affects our community the most um, and so uh, what we're trying to do is see whether we can actually through some of these discussions uh, listen to what the concerns might be uh, from the community, um, hear what they are and then see if there's ways in which we can try to address those concerns and indeed try to um, see if we can increase the uptake of the vaccine amongst our community in order to ensure we have the best, best health possible. So um, yeah, here to hear your concerns, uh, try and answer any questions and see um, 
ways in which we can improve community engagement, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Um, can I introduce Dr. Kiran Collison? Yeah, hi, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice that people have taken time out to, to join this conversation, such an important conversation. Um, I'm Kieran Collison, I'm a GP as well, and I work in Oxford. Um, uh, in a similar way to Amir, I, I work in the uh, Oxfordshire Clinical Commissioning Group, which is the organisation that really plans healthcare services for the county, both in terms of GP practices and hospital services. So it's really important to me to hear from everyone today as to how, how you can feed in your views really on, on how we can do things better. Um, I'm really keen to hear your questions as well. I'm really open to hearing suggestions on what we could do to change things. This is all for you. You know, I really want to hear. I think long gone are the days when high level policies are made uh, without interaction. This has to be a conversation. This has got to really be involvement of all of us together and how we create services uh, that works for everyone and everyone is different as well so how do we make sure we tailor things so it works for each and every person so we're talking about the vaccine today and what I have noticed um, reflection over the last year with the pandemic is that some people have, have suffered more than others and what I wouldn't want to see is that to continue and the vaccine you know is one way out of this pandemic and if we're starting to see some people take vaccine more than others we could see some people more protected than others and what i would hate to see is any gaps widening further than they already have as a result of the pandemic so very very much in listening mode i i want i don't want to talk much really i want to hear from you i want to hear your questions i want to hear your suggestions on how to make things better so thank you for having me and i look forward to the discussion thank you dr kiran um i have two hands up on my screen um well i have three now um so i'm going to go to javed first then i'm going to go to mabin then uh, Faisal and then Adiba. So, Javed, can I come to you first? Um, thank you, Nadine, but I didn't put my hand up. Okay, well, okay. Mabeen, I've got your hand up. Can I ask, is that, did you put that hand up or did you not put that hand up? Um, as um it's, I, I think that was from the alt Y, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind saying something now. So, um, okay. Salaam Alaikum everybody. Um, it's brilliant that this conversation is happening because we do need this conversation happening, um, obviously. Um, I think some of the concerns that I've heard are a lot around the side effects of this uh, vaccination. So we all know that there's a lot of fake news um, around the vaccine, which a lot of people have access to. Um, and at the moment, I think a lot of people have found it quite difficult to decipher what is the facts to what is fake. Um, and I think that's a concern of um, everybody, so young and old, and a lot of um, elderly family that I speak to, as well as um, younger um, people in the community. Um, there is a, that is one of the concerns. Um, and some people that have had the vaccination haven't had um, very good side effects to it. So they have had, um, side effects um, that have meant that they are in bed for a week or so. So I would like the doctors, um, it's brilliant to have you on, on the panel, um, I would like to have some um, feedback from that because that as a, my background as a, sci as a scientist, um, I would have said to everybody go have your vaccination. Um, but having seen some or heard some of the side effects that this vaccine has um, um, uh, kind of um, instigated in some people that have had the um, jab, I would be a little bit reluctant myself. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mabeen. Okay, I, um, first of all, can I take your question and then we will go to one of the doctors. Yeah, I'm sliding up everybody as well. Um, firstly, thank you for organising this. <clears throat> it's very beneficial, but mine was more um, a suggestion on behalf of 
Central Oxford Mosque. <clears throat> what we did is we we try we're trying to be proactive on this. Um, as um, Sister Mabin just said, there's so much fake news going around, and unfortunately, a lot of these videos are targeting the Bain community, um, and they've got people from the Bain community that are you know saying things against the vaccine. So what we did is at Central Oxford Mosque is we tried to be proactive and we approached Dr. Amir Latif purposefully. Um, the reason why we approached him is because everyone knows him, he's local uh, and people trust him. Um, and that's why the video was made. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, what we would have done differently is we would have made sure that our logo was on the video because that video has been shared everywhere on social media prior to us putting our watermark on there. And the reason for putting the watermark on there was people automatically, they trust the mosque. The reason why they trust the mosque is because so many go there, their generations have been going to the mosque. And the video has been shared on different platforms. If it was shared with even the four mosques, for example, as you know, we've got the four mosque forum with uh, Medina Mosque, Bangladeshi Mosque and Bath Street, that would be better. So what I would um, suggest is to, to, to learn from the mistakes that we made by not putting the watermark on there earlier, I would suggest our, our Imam has approached us. Um, he is um, in his late 50s and he said that he actually wants to have the vaccine. And I think it would be fantastic if we could arrange for our Imam and maybe our fellow mosques to have their Imams have the vaccine. And if they agree to it, to have the vaccine um, on, on camera. And if they did that, that would that would uh, benefit the whole of the community because number one they're the imams that we go to for advice and if the imams are willing to do that um especially i imam for example he's come to me saying look Vessel, can you help me get the vaccine i said look I, I don't have those contacts but i think that would be very powerful um and that would be a great message to send out thank you Vessel. okay so there's an initiative there i think it's called imams vaccine together which I will pass on to our comms colleague to come back to you. But I think that's really positive. Um, so Dr. Kiran and Dr. Amar, the question from Abin is around assurance and side effects. I wonder which one would like to take that question, Amar? Yeah, I'm happy to. Mabin, Assalamualaikum, Jazakul Khair for the question. Um, so it's a very fair question. I think um, uh, looking at the side effect profile, it's a bit unusual for patients to have ended up in bed for a week or so. Um, the, so I, I don't know exactly what happened in that scenario. The typical side effects, the main side effect is you have a slightly sore arm. Uh, that's because we're essentially injecting a, a, some, some solution into a fixed volume. And so that causes a little bit of discomfort for a couple of days. It's not completely unusual. It's, uh, it's a, also a common side effect to also have a flu-like illness. Um, so similar to if you have the flu jab, it, they're not live, virus, uh, live vaccines. So they don't actually cause the virus, uh, cause the illness, but they can cause your body to kind of, you know, build an immune response. And as part of that, um, you can get a flu-like illness. So by that, we mean you can get a slight mild fever, feel a bit fe uh, achy, mild headache. Um, my experience has been that actually patients, if they have that, it lasts for a day or so. Um, and, uh, and then after that, they're better. I think it's important, really important to try and explain what the purpose of the virus is. Uh, sorry, the purpose of the vaccine is uh, obviously to fight the virus. Now, people, when we look at what the effects of the virus are, really we focus in on the number of deaths that happen, because actually that's the thing that has the, a, a definite um, you know, end point, you've definitely died from it, unfortunately. What's maybe less talked about is actually the number of patients that we're finding that are coming out with what's called long COVID. So after the video that I put out last week, um, you know, I've had people from the community approach me. Uh, there's people in our community right now who uh, so will know them, actually. There's people in our community right now on ITU, uh, on a ventilator. There's people in our community right now suffering from long COVID and actually having um, difficulties with, uh, you know, the, some of the side effects of COVID. So it's really important to try and explain to our community that this isn't just a, like the flu, if you get the flu, you're bad for a bit, and then you're better, inshallah. Um, this isn't like that. There are some significant long-term implications, particularly for our elder members of the community. So um, the side effects generally are quite mild, if I'm honest. 
Um, I've, as I say, we, we've given you know uh, about nine million or so in the in the in the whole country. Uh, you know, myself, I've been in vaccination clinics. I get phone calls back from patients if they're unwell. Um, and as I say, they're probably the main side effects, but the um, the, the benefits certainly outweigh um, the side effects from that, particularly in the older age group. So we know that if you're uh, over seventy, even if you're over fifty, uh, if you're from a BAME background. If you're male, these are all these are all factors for having a more significant illness. Um, exactly why that is, we don't fully understand it, but we just know, looking at the stats, that that is much more likely. Um, so, if we get it as people of ethnic minority, we're more likely to have a serious illness, end up on ITU, and potentially die from it. So, I think we need to really get that message in the community that yes, there will be some side effects, but actually, we don't have a medicine available in the world that doesn't come without a side effect but that the side effects generally are quite mild um, and uh, should be well tolerated by most people in show. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Right, I'm just going to go to Dr. Kiran Collison to also give a contribution. And also, if I can just broaden that out, just to emphasise, is the vaccine safe? Dr. Kiran. I think I know Kieran's been having some IT yeah. issues this morning. I don't know if you it's want me to. My oh. internet is strange things. Hear me. You're just coming back. Oh, in, can, can you hear me? Okay, now. I can hear you now. I'm. I'm so sorry. I've turned my camera off. This morning, um, I you can hear me now. I hear you perfectly. Do say if you can't though. <laughs> Perfect. I'm so sorry. I think it's um calling true. Everyone's on the internet, so apologies. Um, yeah, it was uh, very brief. Yeah, you're cutting in and out. Yeah, um, sure. um, yeah, you are. I don't need to really retosh. Okay, I might. Uh, maybe uh, Mark, you go. You go ahead then. <laughs> Fine. Just uh, just to answer that question, then is it safe? Uh, yes, it is as safe as we can um, uh, say according to the data that we have. Uh, so the data we know um, when they did the trials, it's really important. A lot of people have questions saying, well, look, how do you know it's safe? Because it's been put together so quickly within about nine months when actually we know that most vaccines take two or three years. There are several regulatory hurdles, we call them, that you have to go through. So the first thing you have to do is you try it on. Uh, you know, you might try on animals to make sure there's, you, you understand the reaction a little bit, then that's kind of phase one trials, you'll try it phase two trials, you'll give it kind of to healthy volunteers who don't have the virus at all, to try and understand actually, uh, you know, do they have any sort of serious reaction to the vaccine. So those have also happened. And then the phase three trials is actually what we look at is we say, um, you know, now let's give it to people who uh, are, might not be so fit and healthy. And is there any serious um, side effect or serious uh, consequence of the vaccine. Um, so all those um, uh, regulatory hurdles that would happen for a normal vaccine have also happened for these vaccines. They've all had to go through the same thresholds and the same process. Uh, so that's really important to mention. It just so happens because of the, you know, un, un, uh, uh, unprecedented circumstances we find ourselves in, we have just done these a lot um, uh, kind of in parallel rather than maybe running one after another. So uh, I think the trials uh, had up to 40,000 volunteers. Since then, in the UK alone, we've had 9 million people have the vaccines, um, you know, and there's vaccines obviously going on in other countries as well. So yes, on the whole, uh, the vaccine is safe. Uh, as I was saying earlier, there is no medicine that we have available to us at all, even simple paracetamol that doesn't come with some, without some side effect. But we know that the there were some videos, I think, that were circulated originally that said, oh, you will get irreversible side effects from this vaccine. Uh, that's simply not true. There are no irreversible side effects that we know of uh, with the vaccine, uh, more so than just having as, as, uh, the side effects that I was mentioning earlier. So I think that's really important to say. Thank you, Dr. Amar. I'm now going to go to Adiba, who has a question. Uh, so I go everybody um, just to quickly introduce myself because I don't know if everyone knows everyone here. Um, I work for the Oxford Hospitals NHS Trust. I'm a research governance manager. 
So um, uh, Dr. Armour, I've probably seen you nodding whilst you were saying all the all the things about the research being approved is because I know I know it inside out. Alhamdulillah. Um, so I've got a few questions and a few suggestions. So I'll just bounce them out so not to waste too much time. Um, what I wanted to know is what's currently being done to um, encourage the Bain community to take the vaccine. So is there anything in place already? Or is it literally we're starting from scratch? Um, secondly, I think we need to break it down to basics in terms of, I think the community may not even understand, like we've explained how the vaccines have been improved, what a vaccine actually is, what to expect. Um, I know you touched on that with your video, Dr. Amu, but I think maybe if it's done with visuals or something, maybe if it's done in Urdu and Punjabi, because you're gonna, you know, there's many people that are not even, you know, fluent in, in, in English um, that need the vaccine, especially the elderly population. Um, touching on Faisal's suggestion, who I know Faisal, hi Faisal. Um, yes, I agree, getting the imams to do, the four imams to do the vaccination will be a great promo. But alongside that, I think you need some female figures as well, because it's not just about the men <laughs> and the imams. Um, of course, everyone trusts them, but I think you need to get some female um, people in there as well, because there's plenty of female um, community leaders here that would, I, I'm hoping, imagine, inshallah, would like to um, help in that. I would be one, because I haven't had my vaccine yet, and I'm due to have mine. Um, and um, so that was the suggestion. Um, so thirdly, information about long-term effects of COVID. I think that's something that needs to come out into our community as well. So it's not just about saving yourself from getting um, COVID and that initial stage of being in, in really bad health. It's actually saving you from that long-term effect as well, which I think is being missed a lot. People are not understanding. Yeah, you might recover, but you're going to have knock-on effects from that for the rest of your life, possibly. So that could be a, a way of promoting um, the vaccine as well. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I could go on forever. I've been thinking about this. I'm at, currently on mat leave. I just had my daughter, so she's like eight months. So she might just turn up in a minute because she's waking up from her nap. Um, but yeah, this has been going, and in my family, it's been going on. I've had fallouts with cousins because I'm pro-vaccine and they're not, they're anti-vax and things. So um, yeah, I'm quite passionate about this to be quite honest. So, and I'm, I'm putting my hand up to help as well, inshallah. I would love to help with um, getting the community to take their vaccines, inshallah. So yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Adiba. I think there was quite a lot there, and I'm just I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, no, hat. that's fine. No, no, that's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased, it, pleased yeah. you've made those points. Um, and I've got a few other people who want to come in, so I'm just going to go to Javed, and then I'm going to go to Dr. Kiran. Hopefully, we can have, get a better signal. Yes, uh, so I'm looking at everyone. Um, I think we need to understand, first of all, what are the concerns? So yes, broadly speaking, it's kind of safety issues. But within that, there are two predominant concerns. One is somehow people believe, and that's thanks to the social media, uh, that it just spreads like uh, fire, um, any information, right or wrong. So the first one is that it will somehow change uh, our DNA structure and make us less Muslim or atheist or whatever. And the other one is that it's going to cause infertility. Now, both of these, particularly the second one, uh, is very scary for a lot of people, particularly if they are like heads of family and if you know that within the Asian community, uh, the hierarchy structure and all that. So if you have a large family and, and the head of the family believes in this uh, rumor or false notion, then it will stop everyone. I've been asked by my you know, mother-in-law that don't get the children vaccinated because that's gonna cause infertility. And I've tried every reason, but somehow it's not working. Now, what Masjid is doing is very good. Uh, and I, I agree with Faisal that we need to kind of bring all mosques in. And not just that, I think any other person who is influential in the community and people know him. And for that reason, I think bringing uh, Amr into that is, is a great initiative because people 
Juno, him and his father, and I have great respect for them. Um, <clears throat> there are, I think, already uh, things being done. Uh, as you know, uh, Brother Munavas made videos in different languages and that's on um, uh, the hospital and his foundation's website and being circulated, etc. I think what we need to do is to bring like imams, uh, and also I agree that we need to use the medium that people know, for instance, uh, Urdu or Punjabi. Um, unfortunately, we, we are restricted. I think not many people can go on um, uh, Zooms and, and these kind of platforms. However, if short videos are recorded in different languages, uh, and also if there is a possibility of having a, I don't know how it's going to work, but small groups of people somehow and let them ask questions in their own languages that they are comfortable with, not just in English. Because unless we break the barrier to reach them, it's not going to work. People want to know this information from like the professionals and not any of the professionals. The professionals they know and trust. So in that regard, people like Kiran and, and Amar will be uh, very helpful. Now, it, I think um, is a, I would say it's a struggle at the moment because a lot of people that I've spoken to, they somehow believe in these false kind of theories. And the biggest task for us is to see how we can break this uh, concept, conception that they, that these vaccines are going to cause these. I mean, very specifically said, the, the two issues, one is uh, altering our DNA structure and the other one is infertility. And, uh, and the last thing I wanna say is that there are already also so many other initiatives uh, on the national level, for instance, the um, DIMA and, and MCB and all that, they all come up and say it's, it's halal, so there's no ingredient that the Muslims can't have. There's no, uh, at the moment, nothing, no evidence to suggest that it's gonna cause infertility or uh, DNA structure to change us that. But we need to probably promote that further. So a number of issues I think there and, and, and some suggestion that we need to work together uh, and bring people in. Imams, for instance, I think have a great role to play in that. So they uh, can, you. from within the, the mosques, can actually deliver sermons. The people have access to um, the mosque uh, broadcast system so they can hear from home. And that need to be reinforced, I think, every so often. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Javed. Okay. Um, I'm, just, I'm just going to ask when people make their contributions, if we can keep them a bit more concise. I've got a number of hands which are up and I want to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity. Um, I'm going to go to Dr. Kieran Collison, and, but I'm just going to actually just sum up what I think I've heard. So Adiba spoke about the encouraging BME community to take up the vaccine. Um, important in terms of we break this down into basics, language, in terms of making sure that the, it, um, the message is translated into different languages. I think Javed just actually spoke about that. And then quite important, just on a broader community perspective, that it's quite important that those messages aren't male dominated. There are women and making sure that women are actually articulating within that space. Um, I think some the principal question was about the long-term effect, um, long-term effect in terms of taking up the vaccine, but also the long-term effect in terms of not taking the vaccine. I think that would be quite an important point. I know Dr. Amar touched on that. And then um, Javed spoke about two important points, one in terms of, well, three, one in terms of some of the fake news, but particularly around the issue around altering DNA and secondly, around fertility. So if I can come directly to Dr. Kiran to see if she can unpack some of that. Dr. Tanvir, can I ask you to put your put yourself on mute? Yes, Hi, and I hope you can hear me. I'm really dreading yeah. my internet cutting out again, so I, <laughs> very frustrating. Um, 
only purely save some of my bandwidth if that's all right um really excellent points and i loved your enthusiasm actually and your passion um, um that we heard just coming through there so i think those are excellent points first one the, the translated materials you're absolutely right there are translated materials out there and there's some that have been done nationally which i think is a good thing so we don't not you know don't necessarily have to keep duplicating that all over the country but having said that there is something about a local nuance so even though things are translated, sometimes they can be translated in quite a formal clinical kind of way that then doesn't necessarily resonate with everybody. And I think the important thing there is, you know, yes, use the resources that are there, but then use them to uh, learn, you know, what the facts are and then tailor it to the people that you then speak to. And I think that's really important because there's no point in, in trying to convey a message if the people you're speaking, you know, you're talking to just can't relate to what you're saying so it's about tailoring it specifically I think the point about local leaders is absolutely vital you know uh, you know we might see you know the prime minister up there saying we need to do this that and the other but actually you know do we all trust everything that we hear from politicians or you know some of the big central leaders you know probably not we probably trust the people local to us that we've known for years we know we can trust them and, and that's where I think the messages need to come. So the point being made about you, you're taking photos of if you have a vaccine or telling people that you've had it and what your experiences were, I think is so powerful. I think the long term effects question is a, also an excellent one in terms of long COVID. So long COVID is really defined as symptoms beyond 12 weeks. So 12 weeks after having the infection. Um, and it's not an insignificant thing to get. In fact, my own, my, my is Pakistani, she's from Karachi. She, um, she, she was umming and ahhing a, a little bit about the, the vaccine. She has had, she's now had it. I have to say the reason why she did have it in the end was because of the, the prospect of long COVID and it filled her with dread um, because she can see the number of people suffering from it. And she wanted to avoid that at all costs. And so while she may have thought the vaccine, you know, might give me a sore arm and I might end up with a little bit of a flu like illness, that is nothing compared to months of fatigue and aches and pains and all the other symptoms that people are getting. In terms of the numbers of people who are getting long COVID, we think one in 10 people has long COVID. That's a lot of people, if you think about it, one in 10. So, you know, it's balancing up the pros and the cons. And for me personally, I've also had my vaccine I, I opted for the vaccine knowing it was a safe vaccine based on all the trials and also knowing that the side effects are likely to be minimal and also knowing that I did not want to be debilitated with long covid longer term so that for me absolutely swung it um I'm really keen to explore the points around the the, the anti-vax type messages that that were mentioned as well um, infertility and altering DNA are two points that I've heard many, many times, and there's absolutely no evidence for either of them. And if you think back to all the vaccines we've had over the decades, none of them affect none of them affect fertility or affect DNA. And this one really works in a very, very similar way. You know, it just provokes your immune system so that when you do then come into contact with the virus, it can fight it quickly. Thank you, Dr. Kirin. I, um, Rasheen, can I come to you? I think you've got- DNA, a so you're just, sorry, I'm going on. Yeah. No, sorry, sorry. It's just, I, th I, th I thought when you cut out, I thought that pause was when you had concluded. It was probably a sensible time to stop. Otherwise I'll talk all day, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rasheen, can I come to you? I think you've got a question. Well, I just want to highlight, I think the main points being this uh, Adiba and uh, Jawad talked about are very important. I think um, as a part of a Kurdish community, we are more likely to listen to our leaders. So I think what the council needs to do at the moment is just, I like the idea of introducing short videos in a different languages, including Arabic, Kurdish, and a Facebook platform is so powerful at the moment in terms of uh, vaccination and talk about the its safeties. So I don't know if the council could do something about it, like creating small videos about the vaccine and distribute it to 
different communities, leaders, and they constantly they can communicate their own members. And also it's not just the social media, if we can talk about producing short leaflets, because what the council needs to, be, to do is it's, it's our local institution and we trust the council, what they're doing, most of us, let's say. Um, if it's like it, literally very short leaflets in the different languages being distributed to all households in Oxford, Ox Oxfordshire, is something could the council could work on it. And also just running more sessions, raise more awareness about the importance of vaccination because I do, um, I've attended one session about a couple of weeks ago with East Oxford Community Centre where Hosnia and other doctors talked about the vaccine and its safety and about different myths about not having the vaccines. Uh, I think we need more of those and I know um, the Labour Party also running few sessions from time to time to raise awareness about uh, the COVID-19 and a vaccine. If you, if the council con could contact those particular people and just make it as a bigger group, just discuss it, bring people from different areas of Oxford, Oxfordshire to talk about it and ask them to go after that and just spread the word. Thank you, Rasheen. Um, I mean, I, th I think you make a number of vital points and, you know, as the council director, if I can just respond to some of those points. Firstly, I think it'd be quite useful there's, there's people around this round on this call where we would want to um, get people to actually make a one minute, two minute video that can link to this conversation so we can actually get that conversation out beyond the confines of this Zoom call. Um, the point that you make in terms of using different mediums, I think is, ab is absolutely an important one and it will take a if it, it will take a whole approach rather than actually just you know one approach which actually works. I think it's also important, particularly given the use of technology, some people actually get used to using technology, um, some people, um, but also to make sure that these conversations um, can actually take place in a way where people can actually ask questions, get responses. And sometimes it's not really just always the size of the group, it's actually about the quality of the discussion, which is really going to actually matter. But I, um, but your point in relation to different languages is quite important. I mean, Kirin has already referenced that there's actually a number of initiatives which are actually taking place in different um, initiative, um, languages, but, but the very localised, the very nuanced point is quite crucial. And what we want to do as a council is actually work quite closely with the local community groups, which we have been doing in terms of making sure that we can, whether it's um, Dr. Kiran or Dr. Amar or whether it's an, an, any, anybody or whether it's Adiba, is to actually have these conversations and making sure that we can actually get this conversation far and wide as we possibly can. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just conscious that there's other people who want to ask questions and I need to get to them. So Ijaz, can I come to you directly? And Faisal, I have uh, Yes, yeah, so welcome everybody. Um, I think the biggest issue is the question of trust. Um, when, when the pandemic started, um, all the frontline um, staff, or a lot of, were banned from the Bain community. So at that time, with the reporting, it was felt that they didn't have all the protective equipment and stuff. And now, when there is a vaccine, um, they're really being pushed to have it. Um, so, you know, that just uh, compounds the mistrust, maybe, that, you know, originally there wasn't enough protection for the Bain community, and now they're being really pushed. I know the figures suggest that, that the Bain community are not having the vaccine, um, but however, that doesn't translate to what people see on the street or what they hear. Um, going on from that, so that's really, I think it's just the trust is the most uh, important issue. Um, the fake videos and stuff they're important um and they need to be um sort of like um contested and stuff um and also like Fassel said if we recognize people you know leaders people from the community having the vaccine it encourages more people so maybe there needs to be smaller groups of people talking having the vaccine and you know if i've had the vaccine I, i'm quite far down the list but if I had the vaccine, I make a video saying I had the vaccine four or five days ago. Um, 
I'm still here. I feel fine. I can now get on with my life. Um, because I know from the elder parts of our community, they're quite keen to have the vaccine. So I'm a bit worried that at the moment, the figures say that 15 to 20 percent of um, Asian people and up to 30 percent of black people are not having the vaccine. What's going to happen when that comes down to the lower age groups? Because that's I think that's going to be even worse. Um, as far as I can tell, um, I'm speaking with my own experience, people that I've spoke to, um, they just want to get on with their lives. So, you know, if they're 70 plus, um, they're quite keen to get it so they get on with their lives. Um, I know that I'm going on a bit now. Um, and I'll just say that what Adiba said, um, the trust and short, sharp messages are going to be best. And we have to be realistic. In, in the Asian community, the people that you're targeting at the moment, i.e. the first top four groups, they're not really going to be on Zoom meetings, um, YouTube channels, um, and I see what Brother Javid said about the infertility, um, you know, with all respect, if we're losing people not having the vaccine that have 70 plus, I'm not, that's not a concern for them, I would imagine. Um, so that's that. And, you know, this call, we have about 40% female, so that's wonderful. We can carry that forward. So it's all good um, on that sense. But I just do, I am wary that if you force feed somebody something, you get their back up. At the moment, all the news is that the BAME are not having the vaccine. Um, so that you could actually compound the mistrust by just force feeding a message. So we just need to be careful, I think. Thank you, Ajaz. Okay, I'm going to take one other question and then I'm going to go to one of the doctors. So I'm going to go to Mabeen, then Faisal, then Sadat, and then Samira. So Mabeen, you first. Sorry, I hadn't raised my hand, um, but I can't. Hand. Sorry? Okay, was it an old hand? It must have been an old hand. However, okay. um, I could say something. Um, so thank you for all um, that. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of really good things there to think about. Um, one of my concerns is that it's not actually just the um, older generation that have the reluctancy. It's also quite articulated um, second generations that have the, the reluctancy to get this um, jab because of what they are listening to on the news as well. Um, because there are talks of the new variants there um, of um, COVID. So how effective is this vaccination program against all these new variants that are out there? Um, I know um, that the um, the um, amount of the new variant of this um, virus out there isn't, we don't really know, um, and I assume it's low, um, and there's a lot more of the first variant out there, which is what this vaccination was targeted against. However, what, um, how effective would this vaccination be? Um, so we're, so we're, we're pushing people to get this vaccination, which is brilliant, and they should do, but how effective is that vaccination going to be once they've got it, if there are new variants of this disease out there? This may or may not be a question that we can answer today, but uh, it will be interesting just to see what you and uh, what the input would be there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nadine. Um, I'm going to go to Dr. Amar, and I think there's two questions there. There's one about the point around trust, and Dr. Kiran has just put something in the chat box, which I'm going to read out, and it's something for everyone to consider. So Dr. Kiran's quite keen to hear whether older and younger people are equally concerned, or is it more than one than the other? And um, so going back to you, Dr. Mind, the second part of the question was around um, the effectiveness of the vaccine against variants. Yeah, thank you, Nadine. So, Ijaz, uh, I think you raise a very um, good point about mistrust. Um, there is mistrust from uh, the wider BAME uh, ethnic minority groups uh, due to healthcare, but that's not all unfounded, right? So, if we go back in the history of healthcare, there have been some unfortunate, uh, uh, to say the least, uh, examples where uh, the BAME, BAME groups have not been treated very well, they've been enrolled into trials without knowing it, you know, if you read some of the history around this, some of it's quite scandalous, actually. Um, so some of the mistrust absolutely is there. 
Um, I, what's the way around it? Well, I think a lot of the comments that people have raised already, actually, uh, we need to make sure that we don't sideline people who have concerns to say, oh, well, your concern's not valid. We need to hear those concerns. We need to try and understand where they've come from. And then we need to be able to respond to them as best we can. Um, and, and, and I agree with what people have said before that giving a local response makes people, um, you know, feel happier or feel more reassured in order to take up that advice. So that's what I would say uh, in regards to the trust issue. And that's why, you know, I've kind of got involved uh, partly from Facebook saying to me, look, do a video. Uh, also, Nadine contacted me via the CCG and I'm very happy to, you know, speak in any uh, forum that people want to uh, ask me to speak in. In terms of the new variants uh, question, Mubin, that you asked, it's a very good question. And one, if we're completely honest, we don't know the answer to just now. Um, if we uh, look at other viruses, uh, such as influenza virus, flu, flu virus, we know that there is normally some cross protection from one variant to another. Um, the degree of that cross protection is difficult to quantify until you understand that particular variant. So yes, there's a possibility that you get vaccinated against one variant, which we have had, um, but that actually future variants come out, which you don't have so much protection against. That's a, a significant possibility. It's not dissimilar to something like the flu jab though, right? So that's why we have an annual flu program because actually we know that the variant changes. Uh, and so there is the thought, we don't know at this stage because we're just too early in the whole uh, vaccination program to know the answer to this. But I think um, that there is a thought that it may well be that this vaccine has to be an annual vaccine that we all have. Um, and then I just wanted to return then finally to Ijaz's point about the younger generations. And I think, Ijaz, you hit the nail on the head uh, about some of our concerns. Um, most of, uh, or many of the older people, I think you're right, will probably accept the uh, vaccine because actually uh, some of the things that uh, people are worried about, like fertility, you know, it won't affect that age group, obviously. Um, but certainly as we get down, uh, not just to the younger age groups in terms of age, but the people who are clinically more at risk, so people who would normally be entitled to the flu jab, people who may be shielding but may not be have you know asthma COPD other health problems diabetes we know is very common in our community and if you catch COVID and have diabetes your risks of having serious illness go up significantly um, so I think that's part of the reason why we're starting this program of speaking to communities and trying to understand what the concerns are because we do need to make sure that as we go down the younger age groups that people understand that it's just as important for them to have it. Uh, you know, just in the last few weeks, um, I've admitted, you know, people in their 40s and 30s with no medical back, no medical problems in the past, who suddenly have very low oxygen levels um, and need to go into hospital. So we need to be really clear here. Yes, your risk of your percentage risk of uh, having serious illness is higher if you're older and have a pre-existing medical condition, but there is still a significant risk to everyone. Um, and so we just need to get that message out really. Thank you, Dr. Omar. I'm going to now move to Faisal. And then Thank you, Nadeem. Uh, yeah, Nadeem, so just a few other points I wanted to, to make. One of the main ones is I think because of, because of what's going on with the pandemic, we need to have a bit of unity, all of us do in this community. People have always had issues. Um, I understand from what Sister Deba said, and you made some really good points, Sister, about equality and female representation. That's always been a historic problem uh, in, the, in the mosques. It always has been. Um, and we've worked towards it, and I know the other masjids have worked towards it. But I think what people need to realize is you can only have a male imam. This is why we mentioned it's got to be a, a male imam who's doing it. Now, We've been doing a lot of other initiatives and we've been working very closely with Lenny at the council. Um, and Lenny's been doing fantastic work with us. Um, one of the things we did, which was very subtle, was we started doing it by step by step. So we opened up our car park to St. Bartholomew's Medical Center and the Munza Warehouse Center for their vaccinations. So every Saturday and Sunday, our congregation, because we're still having the Jamaat prayers, which is probably you'd get about 15 to 20 people, predominantly elders going there. And they see that we've opened our car park up with Lenny, allowing people to park for the vaccine. Um, we've got other ideas that we're looking to push. Um, so in response to um, saying there's a lack of female representation, 
Um, our response to that is the imam's wife is also looking to get the vaccine done. Um, on top of that, I would welcome any um, females, uh, sisters, aunties, etc., that are having the vaccine and are happy to go on the camera, then why don't we share that on our social media at the mosque as well? We'd be more than happy to do that. Um, that's, that's the main thing is I think we've all got to be united Put all of our differences aside, we might have a, a reservation or concern saying that the, that females aren't represented, and, and that, that is a just concern. But I think we need to put that aside and say, how can we work forward to do that? So I've mentioned the imam's wife. I've mentioned the car park that we're doing. Um, we also, uh, I'm just going to highlight one issue. We, we've talked about youngsters, but we've actually got a case of a lot of elders in the community and I'm sure a lot of the people on this forum will know someone that have actually flown to Pakistan. So they've gone back home um, in our community just to avoid having the vaccine. Um, and that's a, a serious matter that's, that's happening, the distrust. So the more we can unite, the more we can actually push these videos, um, I, I, think, I think we'll get there. But just remember this one thing, the main, the main word here is trust. And the mosque does have the trust all the mosques do have the trust of the majority mm -hmm. of their congregants. For example, if you don't trust the imam, you're not going to read prayers behind the imam. That's one of one of, one of the, the laws of Islam. So that's one thing that we need, need to play on. And Lenny and myself did have a, a, a good uh, discussion about that. And we've got a lot of ideas that we're going to push forward, inshallah. And, and that's you, what Faisal. Okay, Faisal. I'm going to... Um, I'm just going to read a couple of questions, but then I'm going to go to Sadat. I mean, I think, and these might have been partly addressed, but Mirza Fadab Beg says in the chat, can someone, can someone able to provide any figures or percentage regarding how many people from the Asian community actually refuse to have the vaccine? If there is any, and Ijaz has responded, I have read there's around 18% and around 30% in the black community. Um, so just something to uh, that I might ask um, Dr. Kiran or Dr. Amar to um, respond in terms of take up. Um, I'm just going to go to Sadat and ask him to um, pose his question. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for um, Amir and Dr. Kiran for your explanation regarding the vaccine. Um, I have two uh, concern. One, I agree with uh, Faisal, the imams in the mosque, um, there'll be a good way of um, promoting the vaccine. Um, second one is, I think we've got to be very careful when we start talking about the Bain community. That can have a, a repercussion. Um, I'm for the vaccine and we have an answer in the mosque. The only question that I've had back from people is, how do we have it done? How do we have the vaccine? Um, so, with the same as in the beginning of the pandemic when it first started, you know, they said the Bain community were more likely to have the, the um, um, we were more likely to be affected by this. And I've had my personal experience on this where I've been verbally abused by people because I'm thinking that I am the disease because they see me as a non-white person, as an Asian person. So when it comes to the Bain community, I know there are a few, maybe a handful of them that are probably disagreeing and not want to have this, but maybe we should identify these people and speak to them. But of the vast majority of the people, I've not come across very many people that are saying that, you know, I disagree and I'm not going to have it done for this reason or that reason. Um, people have reservation um, saying that obviously it came into existence uh, and it, it was fast track. Normally these kind of things takes three, four, five years, research are done on them and things like that. Uh, and obviously rightfully they have their reservation saying they're gonna be side effects, but I'd rather have the vaccine than thinking about the side effect because um, I'd rather be protected against the COVID than um, uh, you know, thinking about because obviously if there is, it's going to be many years to come, but at the moment, immediately, this is a way out. So, uh, like I said, we have to be very careful when it comes to promoting and, and whether this goes into social media and to the mainstream media, like I said, there's always a repercussion. So this is my question. And um, uh, like I said, uh, the best way to do it is we've announced it in Jummah uh, and we've had a 
good response, and we're going to keep doing it until people, uh, you know, people until people start getting the message. Uh, thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Sadat. Um, Samira, can I come to you next? Hi, everyone. Um, I was just listening to some of the points that everyone's been making today. And I did tell a lot of my family members that I was going to come to this discussion and they were so happy and positive about it. And they were like to me, oh, we really want to know what gets discussed. We really want to know about the vaccine. Come back and tell us. And these were just my family members. So I think there's three points I written down um, that I think and I think the main thing about it is education we Asian community and the BAM community just need to be educated on the vaccine so we can pass it on to our family. Yes, I agree on videos. Yes, I agree, like my brother Fessel said, about the mom getting it done. But more than that, we play a big part. We as, you know, if we were educated and told a lot about the vaccine, the side effects, we can pass that on to our families and we could discuss it with them. So I just feel like if some of us got more educated on it, because all we're hearing about is, oh, rumors are this and rumors are that, but let's forget about the rumors. Let's actually look into the facts. Like I personally, I'm young. I want to know about the vaccine. I want to know what it contains. I want to know how it's halal. I want to know the side effects, but I feel like we haven't been educated enough to know about it like I know there's videos and stuff passing around but not a lot of us use Facebook or not a lot of us know what's going on because we don't really talk to the community much or get involved so I feel like if a lot of our guys that do a lot of work for example um that are well known like Fessel if they were educated more to pass it on to a lot of us family members and community, I feel like main people getting involved and educating the community about it, because there's a lot of negativity going around, would help a lot. And I think, you know, it doesn't mean that just focus on one mosque, Jamaat, go to another mosque where there's a Jamaat and speak to them and see if they can incorporate or somehow pass the message on. So I feel like working together as a community, like Faisal said, um, it would be wonderful. And I think it would help us, all the Asian community, um, a lot in that sense. Second thing um, was, um, like, it, it is incorporated with um, education is dropping sessions. Could there be like, you know, for example, one day at a community center, there's like a doctor of the community came there and for like two hours slot and like some of the Asian community or the BAM community went there and asked questions. Obviously not too many people at once because um, of um, the restrictions, but dropping sessions will be another good, I think. Like you said, not everybody uses Zoom, not everybody um, uses Facebook. So maybe dropping sessions are a good um, suggestion. And third one I wanted to ask the doctors were, vaccine, you're talking about people that are older. I wanna know, what about vaccine for people that have had the virus? and recovered, what do you advise for them? Do they still need to get the vaccine even though they actually made it and didn't suffer that badly? What are their suggestions on that? Do existing COVID patients also need to look into getting the vaccine? And I, don't, I haven't heard a lot about that. So that would be something that I would like to ask the doctors. And that is it, thank, thank you, you. Samira. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to try to summarise some of that and then I'll go to Dr. Amar. So three things. One in terms of the speed of the trials before the vaccine um, was ratified. Secondly, um, there's, and I think there's a continuation in relation to, on one hand, there's but there's been a lot of evidence in terms of the disproportionate impact in terms of BAME communities, but also now that there's a real profiling in terms of really raising awareness and the potential impact that has in you know, where it's actually seen as a perception that 
BAME communities are actually being targeted. So there seems to be a bit of a double whammy, which then actually interplays with the trust point. And then I think there was this other point which were, um, which Samira made around the power um, and the voice of community having a domino effect. Um, just on that, I, I should say that the CCG have produced a really comprehensive um, FAQs. And what we will do is actually circulate that amongst everyone, because I think a lot of the questions that are being asked have already been answered and there's a lot of national initiatives and maybe that actually interplays with the education point. And then I suppose the real clinical question uh, for you to answer, Dr. Omar, is um, what about those people who've had COVID and have actually recovered? Do they still need to actually have the vaccine given that they had the strength to actually recover? So I will pause and see uh, if can unpack a lot of that. Thank you, Nadim. So, yeah, so quite a few, quite a few different points to get to. Thank you, everyone, for asking those questions. So, I think just to take that first question, which I think was from Brother Sadat about um, how quickly the vaccine has been rolled out. Um, yes, it has been much quicker than we would expect. Uh, but part of the reason for that is we're living in unprecedented times. You know, I can't remember a time when we've all been told you must stay at home. We haven't been able to go around and see our families. And so because of that, the level of investment that's gone into this has been also unprecedented. You know, normally uh, companies take years to raise the correct amount of funds and to see that there might be uh, the opportunity to develop a vaccine. But of course, at this stage, governments have been putting a lot of money into it in because they've seen the impact it's had on economies. Having said that, all the steps, as I was saying earlier, that we would expect from any vaccine program to happen have happened in these instances. They've still gone through the same trials that we would expect. You know, as I say, over 40,000 people were involved in the trials. And normally that gives you a good enough um, number to know, is this likely to be an effective vaccine, but also is it likely to cause serious harm or not? And subsequent to that, in the UK alone, we've had 9 million people have the vaccine more worldwide. So I, I would try and reassure you a little bit that yes, it's happened at a quicker speed than we would normally expect, but the reasoning for that is actually, if you look around us, we have had to move at some speed because the impact of COVID on, on all our lives has been quite significant. Then just to come to the question of uh, vaccine hesitancy, I think this is a very good question that I think it might have been Brother uh, Ijaz raised in the uh, in the chat, or maybe may someone else, my apologies if it was, around uh, are we actually finding people decline or not? It, at this stage, we're not finding lots of people saying, no, I don't want the vaccine but lots of people are not necessarily coming forward and having the vaccine. And that's what we have more data on is actually, if you look at the number of people getting vaccinated, how many of them are from what we might call BAME background. And in some ways, uh, that is a problem. And part of the reason is we know there, is, um, uh, there are inequalities in access to healthcare. So we know there are some communities, uh, you know, particularly BAME groups, where actually access to healthcare is just lower. And it'll be for a variety of reasons. One, they don't understand the language. Two, they don't have uh, you know, as, as much understanding of the, uh, um, of the illness. But that's a two-way thing because actually our responsibility as, uh, as doctors is to actually explain that to them. And we may not have done that as well. So of course we take responsibility for that. So that is a problem that actually, if you just roll something out for the whole population, we know that people from BAME background are less likely to actually uh, take things up. Uh, and that's why actually these sorts of initiatives and you guys taking time out to come and hear us and to you know try and build something is so important. I think it might be Brother Sadat asked about how do you actually get the vaccine? So that's really important uh, to explain as well. So mostly around the county, what's happening is groups of practices are coming together because of the logistics in kind of getting a vaccine particularly the Pfizer vaccine, mean that you can't deliver it at each practice, but you might deliver it in groups of practice. So I think uh, Facebook said, you know, uh, St. Bart's uh, across uh, months away from the Masjid, they're one centre, Black Belize is another. There's a few dotted around the city, but also the county. So you can uh, book an appointment there via your own GP. So at the moment, it's by invitation only. So you will get a letter or a phone call from your GP surgery to say, uh, you're eligible, please come forward and have the vaccine. So at the moment, it's anyone who's over 70. 
uh, who's age older uh, over than seven, uh, ages over, than, over 70, if you're a health or social care worker, and similarly, if you're on the shielding list. So that's a very specific group of people who will be on the shielding list. Now, that's really the target is to have vaccinated them all by the end of next week. Next uh, 14th of February is the target. So actually, after that, we'll start then moving into the younger cohorts. Um, so, so that's really how to explain how do you get the vaccine. It's by invitation, you'll be called forward. And when you are, then that's really the message we need to get out to uh, our community to say, look, when you get this offer, please take it up. Uh, Sister Samira raised an interesting question around uh, what about once you've had the, uh, the vaccine? Um, uh, yeah, so this is, I, I see uh, Javeed uh, has also put this question on the chat, uh, if you've had COVID already. Uh, this isn't, so again, we have to be uh, honest in terms of what our understanding is. COVID as an illness has been around for about a year or so in the UK. I think it was the 29th of January last year when the first person in the UK was diagnosed with COVID and maybe in China and Wuhan and so forth, it was a month earlier than that. So what we know from COVID is that you get some level of immunity from COVID by having the illness. How long that is, we don't know. We think it may be a matter of months, but we don't know if that's true for everyone. And we don't know if that's always uh, going to be true in every instance for every variant. So um, how long after you've had the illness or should you have the vaccine after the illness? Yes, you still should. Uh, and the reason for that is because we don't know that you'll have lifelong immunity. In, in fact, the studies seem to suggest that will be a matter of months rather than years that you'll have lifelong immunity. Um, so uh, you should still get the vaccine. Uh, there is some uh, guidance around how soon after you've had the illness should you also have the vaccine. So the guidance suggests that you should consider waiting for four weeks. Now, that's not because the vaccine will make your illness worse. That's really important to explain. The reason for that clarification is um, if you have a vaccine, you can have side effects. And the way that COVID is as an illness is very different to most other illnesses. So if you get the flu or you get a chest infection, you're really bad, you feel really unwell. And then what happens over time is generally you get a little bit better. And with COVID, it's very different. With COVID, what happens is you're not too bad in the first week to 10 days, and then you become unwell. And so what, we, uh, what the difficulty is, if you wait for two weeks after having a COVID test positive, and then you have the vaccine, we don't know, is that just because actually you were going to get unwell because that's your COVID getting worse in the second week? Or is that because of the vaccine, you've had a side effect to the vaccine? So the guidance says that you may want to consider waiting up to four weeks. And the reason for that is that actually um, you uh, then don't have such uh, this, uh, it's easier to differentiate, is it the illness making you worse or is it the vaccine causing a side effect? So I think that's really important. It differs though. So I had a patient, you know, in a vaccine on a clinic on Saturday, one patient who'd had uh, COVID about 10 days ago. And I said, we had a discussion. I said, well, look, if you, this is when we'd expect you to get worse. So if you have the vaccine now, then we won't know. Uh, and so he decided actually, I'm gonna hold off. I'm not gonna have the vaccine just now. And then we ha I had another patient, she'd had it three weeks ago. And uh, so we had that discussion. She said, well, I've not had any symptoms for the whole three weeks. I think I'm okay to have the vaccine. And I said, fine. So we did the vaccine for her. Um, so there isn't a, 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 you know, a definite answer, but generally the guidance says you may want to avoid four weeks. And uh, Brother Javed's question about actually, will you have fatal consequences from having the vaccine? No, you won't. Um, uh, that's not, that, there, there's no evidence of that. Uh, I hope that helps answer the questions, sure. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Um, I'm just going to go to Adiba um, to pause her question. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on a few points as we were talking. Um, so first of all, yes, completely understand only a male can be an imam of the mosque. And I'm not making this into a um, pro-female campaign. It was just a touch on the fact that other than, in addition to imams doing it, there are other people that are females in the community that can have an influence. So inshallah, that will work. Um, the other thing was touching like when, if whatever promo we decide to do for this vaccine, um, touching on the Islamic perspective of taking a vaccine. So that might, there's a whole sort of like group of people that are very re re religiously orientated. And so if you 
focusing on the fact that Islamically you follow the rule of the land, you look at the benefits of um, helping the community as a whole. So if you touch on that, that will pull in, I think will pull in people and and make them so that convince them to take the vaccine as well, inshallah. Um, what Dr. Kieran was talking about, um, is there a difference between younger and older people being reluctant about taking the vaccine? I, I think it's pretty much, it may be equal, but I think the concerns are different. So whereas the, the Asian elderly population are talking about it being halal and affecting our genes and all that kind of thing, I think the younger population might be getting more technical and scientific. So will it protect me from various strains? Um, can I take it once I've had my COVID? So I think they might go more towards the scientific -y, te techy kind of questions. So I think there's concerns in both populations, I feel. Um, in terms of the mediums to be used, yes, you're right, not everyone's on WhatsApp, Telegram, Zoom and all that kind of jazz, but someone in that household will always will be. So, you know, if you are going to get out WhatsApp videos and things, I think it's a great way, because I always show my mum WhatsApp videos and stuff that's on YouTube, and I'm sure other, you know, kids in their household will show the older people. So I think it's a really effective medium um, to use, and it will reach people, even though they don't have it as such. Um, the other thing which I don't know if it can be addressed or not is, I think a lot of people are taking it very lightly, um, what they're taking very lightly is, is traveling to Pakistan. So I think a lot of people are still taking their holidays and, um, and still going out for family weddings and still going out because they need a break um, from this all, which I understand completely, but I think that needs to be addressed. Um, and you know, there's members in my family that are guilty of that as well. Um, and I'm like, no way are you going out to Pakistan? This is not a joke. Um, and they come back saying, oh, but it's not that much in Pakistan. Everyone's fine over there. And I'm like, no, they probably don't have the reporting systems in place. They probably don't have the diagnostic systems in place. So their numbers are not showing what's happening. So it's still, it's still out there and you can't just go out on a holiday and come back um, and lie about going because you're going someone's ill because you're making out that someone's ill there, but you're going out for a holiday. So I think that maybe in a, a light humorous way needs to be addressed as well in our community that you can't just jump on a plane um, and lie about your reason for going to Pakistan. It's just not on at the moment. Um, and I think that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adiba. Um, Shubhanam, can I come to you next? Um, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously I've just been listening into what everyone's been saying. Um, I obviously work, I mean, I don't, I don't do much work so sort of heavily in the community at the moment, but obviously I do hear lots of what's going on. Um, on, on the general front, I mean, I've, I've not had many people resisting the thought of the immunizations or the vaccinations. However, I have come across a few very sort of um, naive videos that people have been posting, and then that's probably what's causing half the distress. Now, what I, I mean, my, I'm just going to give you what I think is this, you know, one way forward to deal with the, all the issues that we have. A lot of it is misguidance, it's all fake news. There is a lot of that going around. The best way to counteract that is with um, another video, which is you know more positive. I do think there's a lot of focus on you know the all of these scares and all, all the negatives and all the side effects. However, what we need to do at this stage is provide the community with reassurance the, of the health benefits, the benefits of having the vac vaccinations. So we do need to, but we need to do that in a way which is accessible and people will listen and it reaches out to everybody. So it shouldn't be done from city council, it shouldn't be done just from mosques. It just needs to be an Oxford community based video, which is um, represented by people from different, um, different backgrounds, different ages. So you've got the older generation of, mums and dads, you've got our generation of, um, of, of, you know, of people and maybe some youngers in there. So you, we do need to make a sort of um, a communication video which goes out, but it's got to be providing very sort of positive, reassuring message which tells people when they've heard it and they've, they've listened to it or they've watched it, that they think, oh, you know what, this makes me feel, you know, I need to have this vaccination for my safety, for other safety. And I think we need to make that video and make it very short, sharp. It's obviously got to be thought out in terms of what the message is. 
but that's what we need to put forward. And I do get a lot of people are not on social media, but it is social media that has spread this wildfire, and it's actually social media which can also counteract it. Um, WhatsApp videos is what a lot of the older generation do watch. I mean, a lot of them, okay, they're not on Facebook, but they are on videos. They all play videos on their phones. There isn't a person on this planet who doesn't have a smartphone nowadays. And I do think those videos are crucial, and I think they are going to get the message across because the ones I've heard are ones that aunties have posted to other aunties. And I thought, oh, God, these are ridiculous. But they will also be the ones who will get the video that we send forward and listen to it and actually hopefully reassure them. So I do think we need that video, but it can't be coming from a mosque. It's got to come from the community as, as a whole. And it may be one that's for the Pakistani community. So you get a mixture of Pakistani people to do one. You do another one for the Bangladeshi community. You do another one for the Sudanese. Because naturally, Pakistani people will listen to their Pakistani trusted community members. And the Bangladeshi community will listen to the back. People do not, that's just a human nature. We will listen to people we know. So you do need to pick people in the community and ask them to make those videos. And maybe some of them can say, okay, I've just had a job. So you, it's not just talk, it's got maybe have some action in there as well. So maybe one or two of those videos, they have to be combined. They've got to show people who've had the vaccination. So ask a few of the elders who've had it, say, look, I've just had my job and this is why I've had it because I want to safeguard myself and others. So I think we need to put that message out very clearly, keep it very short um, because there's too much scaremongery, there's too much on the negative and that's just making people more anxious. So I think the whole video needs to stay away from that and just purely focus on positive, uh, purely focus on the benefits and the health side. And you can bring faith into it. You can say, you know, Islamically, you know, it's permissible. So that can be a very one short snippet in that video. But that's what we need to do is come up with a, a very well communicated um, a video. And I would suggest get one or two people from every generation to be part of that one video because then that goes across the community and that's how the message is going to get out. And I know for somebody who uses a lot of social media and spreads messages through social media, that is the way that's going to work. Leaflets and stuff, and yes, we should have all the mosque visits, do everything else as well, but this is what's going to quickly spread. And that's what people are going to then talk about. So I would suggest make one soon and get it out. And that's the rest of it. You said what you said, and I, I agree with everybody else as well. Thank you, Shubna. Um, I'm conscious I've only got five minutes and I just wanted to, there is one question that I wanted to pose to the doctors whilst we have them. And that is what impact could the vaccination have, if any, on women who are pregnant or attempting to get pregnant? I Kieran? Yeah, I can try and answer this if my internet holds out. Um, so sure. that, that's a really good question as well. So all of, all of um, can you hear me okay, fine. by the way, just start off by asking that. Yeah, go for it. Perfect. Um, so when the, vaccines have, when the vaccines have gone through the trials, um, they, didn't, they didn't have uh, pregnant women as the participants. Um, and and that's understandable. That happens a lot with many trials. You you often you won't necessarily you won't usually recruit people who are pregnant or breastfeeding. So all the evidence that we've got is based on non-pregnant, non-breastfeeding people. Um, so that that therefore means that there there isn't as such the evidence for any effect of the vaccine on pregnant people or breastfeeding people. And but that's not to say that the vaccine will cause harm. Because just by if we look at other vaccines, we know that pregnant women are, are, off, are encouraged to have the flu vaccine, whooping cough vaccine, um, and, and we know that they are safe and, and, and that's what is actively encouraged all the time. So there is some caution, not because people feel that this will cause harm, but really because the trials didn't include um, those, those women in them. So you just there's I guess there's a difference between saying there's evidence of harm com compared to there just isn't any evidence because they weren't included so when it comes to if, if someone is pregnant and they're thinking well I've been called for my vaccine should I have it or should I not that is it's really sort of weighing up the pros and cons and if somebody does have that does put them at high risk if they have the infection um, the non-balance, having the vaccine may be actually right for them. 
if someone is considered very low risk, so the sort of opposite end balance that they want to wait until they've delivered there. They're encouraging people to have a discussion with their own GP um, or nurse at their practice so they can go through pros and cons and, and make that decision together. Thank you, Dr. Kieran. I'm going to bring the session to an end because we only had time scheduled for 11.30. Um, I realise there's still first, so I know you want to come in and I know Adi, you want to come in, but I do need to bring the session to an end. So I just want to conclude by firstly um, thanking everyone for their contributions, for your questions. I think it's been quite a richer discussion. Um, just some action points for us to take away. I think um, there seems to be a number of volunteers who will come forward and actually put a video together. So we will put you in contact. So Jabeen, Lenny, if you can put um, um, possibly, um, if you can send an email around to identify who will potentially make a video. Um, I think the point around fair gender representation is quite critical and I want to make sure that that actually happens. Um, there's, um, and so I, I think Adiva certainly what, would want to do, but I also know some of the work that Shevnam's done and I think that'd be actually quite important. Um, the CCG have produced a really important freedom of, um, sorry, freedom, a frequently asked questions guide. And we will circulate that to every member of this group. I think it's not just a question of, um, of just the alarms at particular times in terms of the mosques, but I think there's a guide there which can actually be distributed. So it interplays with the point in terms of what Rasheen was saying in terms of having a leaflet that we can actually share amongst um, communities. So I think we should use and utilize that opportunity. Um, my IT team will now start looking at editing this video down. We will try to interlink that with whoever the volunteer, the participant is in relation to producing a one minute. And that will then create a video that we can um, have short, sharp and circular via social media channels. And as soon as that happens, we'll also make sure that that's shared amongst yourselves. So you can actually then actually share that amongst the wider community. Um, I think that pretty much um, brings this morning to an end. So I just want to conclude by saying thank you very much. Thank you for the taking the time out. Keep safe and I will hopefully speak to you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>